Hello, this is Pastor Jeff. It is Sunday, January 29th, 2023. We're here in year A. It's Epiphany 4. I'm here before the first service, actually our only service today, which is at 9.15. Um, and then we'll have our annual meeting. The sermon is based out of the Beatitudes, which is Matthew 5, 1 through 12. I will read the Bible verses and then the sermon. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of the Lord. So I have been looking forward to this Sunday for weeks. I was so happy that I was going to have the opportunity to dive deep into our first meeting. I mean, come on. I even have our first reading tattooed on my arm. However, as the week moved on, I decided that I must preach from our gospel reading and tackle the Beatitudes. There is so much that we can learn from the mountain, but I want us to dive straight into the Beatitudes because there is a lot of ground that I want to cover this morning. And most of the blessings, Jesus identifies certain conditions or behaviors as blessed and then provides an explanation. In our Bible study on Tuesday, we talked about blessed and how many languages may be difficult for us to hear or understand. We talked about other possibilities for the word and understanding. The Greek word that is used is markorios. Blessed is the common translation. However, other translations include fortunate, privileged, and happy. Many theologians explain that the word denotes humans who are the privileged recipients of divine favor. If you were not counting, there are nine blessings. These nine blessings can be broken up into three categories. The first three blessings name those who are paradoxically the special recipients of God's favor. The middle four blessings Describe practices that embody the hope for kingdom of heaven and the promise of eschatological reward. Then, the final blessings speak of the adverse consequences of adopting the practices that are demanded in the middle section. Let us be raw and honest for a moment. These nine Beatitudes describe the nature and character of of true disciples. The demands of the Beatitudes are radical. Without a doubt, the Beatitudes are contrary to the values of our society. I think that listening in to the Beatitudes can make us very uncomfortable. We can use the Beatitudes as kingdom-like fruits, and they can become a gauge to see how well we are doing or how much that we are missing the mark. As we jump into the Beatitudes, let me connect us briefly to our second reading. God is not looking for heroes, but for followers, even foolish ones, to shame the wise and the strong. On Wednesday, I tried to fly through the nine fruits of the Spirit, and I'm going to attempt to do the same this morning, but with the Beatitudes, to help us hear each of the Beatitudes in a different light. I will read the Beatitudes in the message and speak oh so briefly to them. You are blessed when you 
are at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. I'm not sure about you, but I know that there have been times in my life that I have felt like I was simply at the end of my rope. I am grateful that at those times, I can hold on to the fact that during those times, there is less of me and more of God. There is something deeper there, though, as well. In Jesus' words, he was trying to share with his new followers that there are individuals who are lacking materially. For us in Door County, individuals are struggling for housing, paying the electricity bill, having their child care bills covered so that they can work or have enough money to put food on the table. They are worn down by the plight of poverty. Their struggle for basic survival crushes their spirit. Jesus says theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and God will set it right. You are blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. These are tough words for us to hear, right? Many of us have experienced loss and grief, and we mourn. There has been so much death in our community. The last 22 months that I have been there, there have been 28 deaths or funerals that we have had. When Jesus spoke, the morality, the mortality rates in the ancient world were so high. Parents could not expect their children to survive infancy, let alone make it to adulthood. In our world today, we have seen war, food insecurity, infectious diseases, and a housing crisis that has caused life to be cut short. When Jesus spoke these words, the hearers were living under imperial occupation. When Jesus was, when Matthew was written, and individuals were now reading his words, the temple had been destroyed, and the people are grieving the violation of their land and sacred space. Yet, to those who are mourning, Jesus proclaims a coming comfort. You are blessed when you are content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourself proud owners of everything that cannot be bought. I think these are some powerful words for us today. The world around us try to define us and mold us, but we need to learn how we can be content with who we are. When Jesus was talking to his disciples and the word meekness arose, he was referring to individuals who were being abused by the wicked who seems only to prosper. Jesus wanted to reassure the disciples that those who are abused by the wicked will inherit the land. God's rule will reverse them. I am sure that Jesus was referencing Psalm 37. It says, before you know it, the wicked will have had it. You'll stare at his once famous place and nothing. Down the earth people will move in and take over. Relish a huge bonanza. You are blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you will eat. When we work up this appetite, we are going to hunger and thirst for righteousness. When we do this, we have the potential to get ourselves into holy trouble. If we look deeply into righteousness, especially rooted in Isaiah 51, we see that righteousness refers to a total societal restructuring that includes the fair distribution of resources and a reimagined society. All will have enough. The original hearers who thirsted for this righteousness would have been those who were on the margins because of the unjust practices of the Rome's rule. 
Are we courageous enough to see where this is just unjust practices in our community and what we may be able to do to bring God's kingdom in so those thirsting will be filled? You are blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourself cared for. Jesus' message here seems so simple. He says that if you care for others and provide resources for the outcast, you will receive mercy. Rome was definitely not known for showing mercy and care for others. Hear this great news. In God's kingdom, all will be welcome and all will have plenty. You are blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. The pure in the heart are those who follow the will of God in their thinking and doing. Jesus will go deeper into the heart issues later in the Sermon on the Mountain. When we commit to God thoroughly, we will see God in a more intimate way. You are blessed when you show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you'll discover who you really are in your place in God's family. Cooperation is so important. Too many times in our lives in the life of the church, we see competition and fighting, and it destroys. The word that Jesus uses specifically is peace. It is very important to realize that in the context of Matthew, peace is not the absence of conflict. Jesus was fully aware that his message was going to cause division. It went against the grain of the culture. Here was a big difference. Rome forced individuals to their rule via violence and threats. When on the other hand, entry into God's kingdom is voluntary. You are blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. The life of disciple of Jesus runs counter to the values of the world. Living here in Door County, no one is looking to kill us simply because we confess Christ. However, when we live a life of justice for the oppressed and marginalized, there will be individuals who will resist us and make life very difficult for us. Not only that, count yourself blessed every time people put you down, throw you out, or speak lies about you to discredit you. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort, and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even, for though they don't like it, I do. So Jesus was sharing with his listeners that they will never be blessed or happy when they ignore or downplay the suffering of others. We may struggle because we have a wrong view of happiness. Come back in three years when we see this text again, and I will dive deep into happiness. But there is a paradox of happiness that I want to share. Happiness sits face to face with the pain of injustice sickness, and death. Why and how? We are doing kingdom work. When we study a faith practice, we can always gain new insight. For me, let me share with you what really stood out to me in my study. When the Beatitudes are rooted in our personhood rather than spiritualized, we can more clearly see the ways that we can act to bring God's kingdom into people's lives. Christopher Holmes goes a little deeper. Let me conclude with his words. It is not enough for the church to repeat God's blessings on the poor and marginalized. It must also commit to transformative action, kingdom practices that work for their liberation. Amen.